it's my pleasure to to be host to Carl Neugebauer, whom I know from the MPI CBG here in Dresden, uh, which is also the, the the lab or the the institute where one of our founders is um, based on. And I met Carly because I was a postdoc there, so it's a very nice to have her to have her here. And, and, and I'm only a data scientist because of Carla pushing me to work more in the computer and get away from the pipette. So I think that tells you something um, about myself. But Carla is now uh, a director at the Yale Center for RNA Science and Medicine. And, and this makes a lot of sense, this, this name, because she's been working on RNA pretty much all her career, nearly the entire life cycle of RNA, going from transcription, splicing, exports, I think I only missed probably degradation because that is not I never fun. worked on translation, <laughs> although I admire translation. Exactly. And and <laughs> relevant for this uh, talk and, and for condensate is that she's from since I was in the lab and probably earlier, she's been an enthusiast in membraneless compartments more than me. In fact, I didn't see the potential huh. and and <laughs> and and um, and and she's going to talk a lot about her work and especially the role that uh, the, the membraneless compartments play into RNA processing and, and, and vice versa, I think, as well. And I think Cajal bodies has been something that's been working on a long time. But I'll just leave the floor now for Carla. Okay, great. Thanks, Antonio. Can everyone hear me? Put some thumbs up. Yeah, okay, Jill. Looks like you sound great. Me. Awesome. Um, okay, so it's really a pleasure to have been invited to the kitchen table talks and initially had asked to go to Boston to be in person, but now I get to be in Dresden in person, which is kind of fun. Um, so I'm really looking forward to telling you about our work um, in the nucleus and also to get some feedback. We're sort of at a point where we have lots of new data that I'm going to be showing. Um, and also a lot of sort of choice points in the road about what's most important to learn about condensation in the nucleus. Um, and so what I'm showing on my uh, title slide here is a HeLa cell nucleus that I labeled with BRUTP in a run-on transcription experiment. I actually did this experiment at MPI CBG, so underscoring my pleasure at being back here in Dresden. Um, I picked it not because of that, but because it shows um, these thousands of transcription sites distributed throughout nucleoplasm, and you can see even the nucleolus here is kind of a big dark spot with a bright spot in the middle, and that's likely there for RDNA that's being transcribed um, for nucleolus formation. And the, um, so I'm going to mention um, some work at transcription sites, especially in the beginning, because it informs sort of how we're thinking about Cajal bodies, which are shown on the right here. Um, this is a recent STED image that in, um, instructed us anew as to the substructure now of um, Cajal bodies, which we didn't know about previously. What we learned recently, and I'm going to be coming back to this, especially towards the end, is that the Cajal body, which we consider to be the green part of this lump, the Cajal body is marked by a scaffolding protein coilin, which I'm going to talk quite a lot about, um, is kind of like a baseball mitt or uh, as like a ball in socket with another condensate um, called the gem. And it, it now seems that these two condensates, I'm going to call them condensates, even though I actually don't formally know they're condensates, so my skepticism can come in towards the end, but anyway, that these two objects in the nucleus are very intimately related, but they're not the one in the same. So, for example, the molecules that are present in gems are not detected in Cajal bodies by proteomics methods, and I'm going to show you those uh, data because we're doing a lot of proteomics right now. Okay, so that was a kind of a little bit of a preview. Um, let me uh, move forward with some of the things I wanted to say. So first, I just wanted to point to the importance of nascent RNA in the nucleus. Um, this is not a nucleus. What this is, it's a very large uh, pair of chromatids that have been dissected out of a newt oocyte. So these oocytes uh, are very highly um, transcriptionally active. And in oocytes um, of amphibians and insects, uh, different species, you can actually haul the uh, chromosomes right out of the nucleus and spread them out in buffer and have a look at them in the light microscope. So that's what you're looking at here. And what you can see are these uh, two chromosomes, this happens to be chromosome seven. 
And you see these sort of lamp brush loops that we're used to looking at um, occasionally in textbooks, uh, but they remind us that the loops that form off of the chromatid axis are tr transcriptionally active genes, basically. And a lot of these loops are not recognizable as loops, but rather as balls of stuff. And I would suggest that these balls are all condensates that represent um, the proteins and the RNA that accumulate at highly active transcription sites. And so it reminds us that in the nucleus, um, objects can form at highly active sites of transcription by virtue of the association of stuff in general with the nascent RNA that's tethered to the chromosome axis, kind of, you can imagine it like Velcro, because you've got the DNA as a substrate and you've got these sort of hair-like projections, um, which are the nascent RNA, acting as a multivalent, you know, lightning rod or something like this. Okay, so this is a kind of backdrop as how I look at the dark matter of the nucleus. I don't know why my slide's not advancing. Let us, there we go. Okay, so this is what happens when you centrifuge those Lamprecht chromosomes down on a slide. Um, now you can fix and stain, and that's what you're seeing here. Um, so this is, again, to continue on this vein, here are these transcriptionally active loops, some of which are very easily recognizable by eye. And so these early structures are actually genes that cytologists rec recognized in the late 1800s. Um, so today we might call those condensates. Um, up here on the left corner, you can see what are, were then called spheres, and we would call these Cajal bodies, the objects that we work on in the nucleus. And so what was observed by Joe Gall and Mick Kellen um, was that these Cajal bodies actually are nucleated on chromosomes, on specific chromosomal sites. You can recognize them because they're usually two balls at the same position on the sister chromatids. So they can be nucleated on DNA. At the same time, you can form extra chromosomal versions of these in oocytes because you're providing the embryo with lots of stuff like a thousand nucleoli and 100 Cajal bodies. And based on our work, which I'll mention, um, this is to support RNA, mRNA biogenesis in the early embryo. So here, what you can see on the right are some extra chromosomal Cajal bodies that have been seeded over here and they've floated away and they've sort of dot the slide, therefore. Okay, so those are some opening comments. Let's see. I'm not sure why I have to hit this so many times. Okay, so coming to the, the cartoon version, um, here we have the nucleolus showing that RDNA is transcribed to form nucleoli. Here we have a pr protein coding gene that we could view as, um, as a object or a location inside of cells. It might be different from the next gene. And then we have the Cajal body, which is the subject that we're gonna talk about today. And there's an interplay between the Cajal bodies and these sites of transcription and RNA processing of protein coding genes because Cajal bodies support the um, assembly of spliceosomal SNRPs, which are required for the splicing of pre mRNA transcript elsewhere in the nucleus. Okay, not in Cajal bodies, but at their transcription sites. And so I'm going to give a little bit of um, introductory information about the spliceosome because that'll be necessary um, for some of the things I'm going to mention. Okay, so this is called the pre-mRNA, um, this is called the spliceosome cycle. I can't see the title of the slide because of this, the people at the top, but oh well. Um, and so the, um, what you're seeing here is a typical pre-mRNA diagram, which has two exons and an intron. And what's being shown is that um, sequentially recruit these different balls marked U1, U2, U4, U5, and U6. And these are these spliceosomal SNRPs. So it seems very complicated and it is complicated. There's 200 proteins. There are all these RNPs that I just mentioned, U1, U2, et cetera. And they're all going to associate with this pre RNA sequentially into at least 10, I think we're up to 10 different transition states in the assembly of the spliceosome. We've got eight different helicases splitting ATP every which way. We don't actually know how many ATPs the spliceosome needs because they probably cleave ATP multiple times. And then we finally arrive to um, catalysis over here. And the important thing to know for this talk is not about splice, splicing catalysis, but rather the effect that splicing has on the SNRPs. 
In particular, I want to point to um, the U4, U5, and U6 SNRP that arrives here as a complex of three different small non-coding RNAs with a whole bunch of proteins. It's been assembled in a very specific way, and what happens at the end of splicing is it's released disassembled and non-functional. So if we were doing a lot of splicing as neurons are doing or early embryos are doing, we could use up the spliceosomal subunits that build spliceosomes in a hurry by doing a lot of intron removal. And so why would we do, be doing a lot of intron removal? That's because each gene in humans has 10, at least 10 introns. And so um, what you could imagine here, imagine this is a gene. This is a really bad diagram of a gene because introns are 10 times longer than exons. Um, these should have, you know, be that much longer, but okay, let's forget about that detail. In fact, each one of these introns has to have a spliceosome built upon it, just the same way I told you for that one intron example. In vivo, we really need 10 of these spliceosomes to assemble on every nascent RNA, whereas we only needed one measly Paul 2 holoenzyme to transcribe that gene. So it's incredibly costly. This ribosome size machine has to assemble on each individual intron in order to um, get it out. And so you could think it could add time to gene expression to have to do this, but fortunately most splicing is very efficient and it's even co-transcriptional. And what that means is that splicing can generally complete in the same time frame as transcription. So that's a relief. However, don't forget that you need all of these splicing components um, to assemble these spliceosomes. And this occurs in the Cajal body. So remember I told you how these splicing components are taken apart at the end of splicing. What happens is they get recycled, of course, because the cell wouldn't be so stupid as to throw away these little subunits that they could perfectly well reassemble. And what happens is these subunits get transported to the Cajal body, which I'm about to tell you a lot about. And that's where this reassembly process takes place. So there's de novo SNRP assembly there, but there's also recycling that goes on there. And it turns out this allows cells and indeed entire organisms to live. Um, and I'm about to show you the evidence for that in the next slide. I do not know why my slides do not advance, but I will keep pressing things. Aha. There we go. Okay, so while I was at MPI CBG, Magdalena Strelecka, uh, graduate student in the lab, did this fantastic experiment that enables me to tell you more also about call bodies. Um, so first of all, I can show you, here is a green ball that's supposed to represent a call body. I actually haven't shown you call bodies before. So here now I'm showing them to you. So these are call bodies present in the bla blastula cells of a zebrafish embryo. You can see this protein coilin that I'm gonna mention a lot. Um, concentrated, this is one nucleus, concentrated in these round blobs. And here are the SNRPs, these guys that I've been talking about, concentrated also in these um, Cajal bodies with, together with the coilin. If we get rid of coilin using a morpholino, what happens is you lose the coilin, of course, but you also lose the concentration of the SNRPs in the Cajal bodies. You don't lose the SNRPs, but you use their concentration in the Cajal bodies, where I just told you that we would previously shown um, this assembly could take place um, using various methods like FRET, FRET methods and so on, looking at um, transient intermediates in the SNRP assembly pathway. Okay, so we can take immature SNRPs and make them into mature SNRPs. This is how they look. Um, and what's the result of knocking them out? The result of knocking them out is, um, Death. Okay, so the embryos die before 24 hours of development, and the reason they die is that there are splicing deficits and a decrease in the number of assembled SNRPs. We can rescue them if we give them back SNRPs. The SNRPs don't contain coilin, but they do contain this essential material that's important for splicing. So that's the basis of our argument that the reason you need SNRPs to undergo embryogenesis is to support the removal of introns in the um, early transcripts made by the embryo. Okay, so we believe that Cajal bodies are important and we are really dedicated to trying to understand how they form and function. All right, great. Okay, so what are the burning questions about Cajal bodies? 
Uh, how do they form? I just said that. Um, one question, another question is, do they have any other functions? And that's sort of one of those questions you make up after you know the answer. <laughs> it seems to us that they do have other functions and I'll allude to those in a second. And also to come back to the question of what are the components of Cajal bodies? It turns out that most uh, condensates or compartments in the nucleus are kind of haphazardly described. Um, and so I'm gonna take you through an attempt to comprehensively define uh, the components of our nuclear body. Yes, somebody, is there a question? Yes. Yeah, I have, I have a question. Um, so you say other functions, what is the primary function? Do you think Cajal bodies and coiling serve to chaperone the assembly or reassembly of SNRPs? Is that, is that your thesis? Yes, so we, sh we uh, sorry, I had to kind of skip over that older work, but we did um, all kinds of Monte Carlo simulations of SNRP assembly. I'm looking at you in the screen. Sorry, that's sort of weird, isn't it? Um, <laughs> um, we have shown that this, that SNRPs as assemble, this tri-SNRP that's made of three different RNPs, assembles in the Cajal body. We can observe this with FRET. We can observe the transient intermediates. And uh, the outcome when you get rid of the Cajal body is that they don't get concentrated into the Cajal body and likely assemble at a much lower rate. And that's supported by the experiment that I just described to you where the embryos couldn't live because they couldn't splice out their introns. Uh, um, that, that's a perfect segue to my follow-up question. So okay. you mentioned specifically neurons and embryogen embryogenesis are there, this is a naive question, but are there like acutely high splicing demands in those, you know, tissues or developmental stages? And, and likewise, you know, messing up Cajal bodies is embryonically lethal, but can you, what about like HeLa cells, for example, can they tolerate perturbation to Cajal bodies? Okay, that's three questions you're asking me. All right, great. <laughs> okay, so the, in the embryo, you're absolutely right. You need to splice the transcripts and you desperately need uh, spliceosomes because you transcribe and process the RNA within a single cell cycle, which in embryos is 15 minutes long, at least in these embryos. They have very short cell cycles. And so our argument is that this potentiates the need for efficient assembly of SNRPs. Um, in a HeLa cell related to that, HeLa cells divide every 24 hours plus their aneuploid and they don't even care if you hit them with all kinds of poisons. So it is true, you can delete coilin from HeLa cells and they seem to be just fine. I don't really care that much about that. Um, there are probably a lot of things HeLa cells can do without in order to divide and be these horrible cancer cells, but um, so it does mean that you need to go to maybe more physiological or uh, challenging situations that depend on efficiency. So I'm not telling you the only way to make a SNRP is to go to a Cajal body. I'm telling you that at least according to our modeling and the tests that we've done, we think that assembly is more efficient in the Cajal body as a result of it like 20 fold is our estimate, a 20 fold increase in the concentration of the precursors that'll now meet each other more efficiently um, in this location. If you, if you, you know, so the rate limiting step is actually the productive hit between two substrates. They have to hit each other by Brownian motion. They have to find, uh, you know, the, the face. It's like a thousand fold uh, hit that you take to the efficiency of assembly of anything because you have to keep hitting, you know, the face of your partner and find the guy that you're gonna actually bind to. And so that's why we think concentration in a particular location is such an important thing. However, I do have a favorite idea, which is that the molecules within the Cajal body could establish as a kind of reactive surface for SNRPs. And that would be sort of additional to this idea of concentration. So. We would really like to ultimately visualize by molecular structure what's going on inside. And you'll see that we're kind of getting there with single amino acid mutations and so on um, to see exactly what this um, object means for how the SNRPs are oriented. But I mean, this is actually a big macromolecular question. I'm not exactly sure. 
how, how this is going to pan out. Um, it's a few steps away. Now, uh, you also asked me about the brain, and I mentioned it because Cajal bodies were discovered by Ramoni Cajal in 1895 in the vertebrate brain. So one of the things that nastily happens to me in grant panels is people say, well, most cells don't have Cajal bodies, and so they're very weird, and therefore this question is unimportant. And I want to tell you that every cell we've ever looked at in a zebrafish has them. Plant root cells have them. Um, brains of owls have them, as Ramonica Hall showed. The weirdos are aneuploid tissue culture cells that don't divide very quickly. So cell lines that divide slowly do not show, we do not see them as large objects, if you get my drift. I think you know what I mean by this. Okay. We can come back and discuss these things more. Which we highly encourage. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Carla. Okay, so now burning, how do they form? And do they have other functions? I do not know why I cannot advance my slides. Does anyone have any suggestions? No, it's probably just slow zoom. Aha, okay. <laughs> so um, here is a study that we published in 2014 that, that informed us on another function that we don't really know we don't know if it's important and some welcoming uh, comments. Um, so this was a study done by Martin Machina, um, actually largely in Dresden and then finished off at Yale. And um, what he did, he kind of threw some omics at this protein coilin. Um, so this is, as again, this scaffolding protein of cohol bodies. If you get rid of coilin as we did in the zebrafish, you get rid of the, the object. So what he did was he did a clip experiment. So this is a UV cross-linking experiment where he asked, are there any RNAs that bind to this protein? And if so, where do they bind? And the answer was yes, there are many RNAs. Of course, he wanted a long non-coding RNA, but he didn't get any single long non-coding RNA. He didn't get any mRNA. He got these small RNAs, U2 snRNA, U3 snRNA, U5 snRNAs. These are the RNAs that form those SNRPs. Huh. So the coilin is actually seemingly binding because UV crossing is a zero angstrom method. They're binding to these snRNAs, the coilin molecules. At this, in the same breath, he did a chip experiment. So he said, I wonder if I could ship coilin to any particular chromosomal sites. And indeed, he could chip them not to any other location, but to these genes encoding those snRNAs. So these happen to be um, PAL2 genes. So these are PAL2 driven individual genes that produce these small RNAs. So they're very tiny genes. Um, they have you know, transcription at them. And then here is the coilin pile up on top of these genes. So that says the coilin is on the chromosome and then it combined RNA. And the result of that was the drawing of this model that the coilin in the green ball here might be binding to the nascent RNA. And that's why they form as a larger object on these sites as visible by the coilin and why they're transcription dependent. So I didn't mention that previously, but in mitosis, they dissolve and in uh, transcription inhibitors, for example, um, they largely go away. Okay, this is also um, borne out by an in situ hybridization experiment done by a different lab, by the Dunder lab. And so I just wanna focus your attention on this. So this is a multicolor fish um, experiment. So here's coilin in blue, so that's the Cajal body. And then here are four different loci um, these U1, U11, histone, two locus. I'm sort of skipping over the histone relevance here. So very often, call bodies are merged with what are called histone locus bodies into one object, and they're very abundant on the histone genes in, um, in many of, of the systems that we work on. So here, this cell, um, you can see all these gene loci clustered around the Cajal body. So it's not on top of the Cajal body, but adjacent to. So we still consider this to be a working model, right? So we haven't proven that it's the nascent RNA that nucleates the Cajal body, but it seems very clear that the Cajal body has the capacity to pull together different chromosomal regions that represent these different genes. And these different genes are on different chromosomes. I didn't say which chromosome because in different species, there are different chromosomes, but these are independent 
chromosomes. So in other words, another function of cajal bodies would be to pull together these different chromosomal arms bearing the U2 tandem repeat, the histone repeats that, that contain all of the uh, replication dependent histones, U5, U3, these are all coming together at the cajal body. So we don't know, again, if this chromosome confirmation that's created by the cajal body is essential, but it's certainly having this effect. And so it's worth uh, keeping this in the back of our minds as we try to entertain um, potential new functions uh, for the cajal body, certainly a morphological you know, function. Okay, so those are the burning questions. So how do they form? They form at transcription sites. Um, do they have other functions? Well, maybe this clustering function. We also know that they are uh, they have a function in snow RNA assembly. I skipped over that, and the, uh, let's keep it that way. What are the components of cajal bodies? These um, snRNAs, snow RNAs, coilin, as I've told you about it. Um, and so now I want to delve into more uh, in more detail how this how do they form question. And um, right, so so let's expand that to how does this larger object form? Like, you know that histone locus bodies probably are these little tiny dots that are really the transcription sites of histone genes. And so what it seems to us is the Cajal body is a bigger object, it's a larger object. And so um, it seems to be a higher order object than simply a transcription site. Um, and so this is what I mean by how does the larger uh, object form? Um, we also wonder about novel functional protein groups that could be um, in there in terms of um, comprehensive identification of components as well as um, the, the function question. Okay, so let's start with the, what we've been learning recently about assembly. All right, so here's a, finally I'm telling you about the molecular structure of coilin. So it's a protein with about 580 amino acids and it has an N-terminal domain, an intrinsically distorted region in the middle, and a C-terminal domain at the end. The C-terminal domain is actually a folded Tudor domain that lacks the capacity of a normal Tudor domain, um, which is to bind dimethyl arginine. I'm gonna be talking about dimethyl arginine in my, the last section of my talk. Um, the reason we, uh, I'm going to focus in the next few slides on the N-terminal domain is that it, like the C-terminal domain, um, is among the highest conserved uh, portions of Cajal body of the coilin. And because um, the deletion of the N-terminal domain prevents the de novo formation or the localization of the molecule to existing Cajal bodies. So in other words, if I transfect a delta NTD construct into cells that have cajal bodies, that protein will not go there. And if I have cells that don't have coilin and I transfect a full length coilin molecule, I can make new cajal bodies, but not if I lack the N-terminal domain. So that's, what, that's why we thought the N-terminal domain is super important for assembly. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you about these experiments working on the N-terminal domain. And this was started by Martin Maschina, um, the same person who did the CLIP and the CHIP experiments. And so what he decided he would do is start transfecting cells with only the N-terminal domain and see what happened. What could he build up with just the N-terminal domain? So this is the domain that we attribute assembly to. So what he did was he took these coilin knockout cells, they're mouse cells, and he expressed the NTD initially without a nuclear localization signal. He forgot the nuclear localization signal. And what he discovered was these large fibrils or filaments or oligomers, or I don't know what you wanna call them. I'm arguing with the uh, journal editors right now, what should we be calling these things? They kind of look like C. elegans embryos. And crazily, one of my grant reviewers thought they were C. elegans embryos. They're about 10 microns long, This these, these guys here, they're really impressive. Um, we don't know that they're exclusively made of coilin. We have not been able to find any other component uh, present in them, and we have shown that they're not amyloid. So um, the kind of jury's out what exactly is in them. If you express um, the NTD, however, in the nucleus, this does not happen. Instead, you get these little round puncta 
as well as some hazy, um, hazy signal in the nucleolus itself. Let's ignore that for now, if you don't mind. Okay, so we get these little round things in the nucleus, yet we get these big long things in the cytoplasm. What does that mean? Hmm, okay. So since we um, thought this was cool that the NTD shows the ability to self-assemble in a different way in the cytoplasm from the nucleus, and in the nucleus it makes round things that resemble the round things that are whole bodies, we decided to move forward and look for amino acid changes that could modify those behaviors. And so here you can see the um, sequence of the N-terminal domain. You also see a predicted structure down here at the bottom, which is a ubiquitin-like fold. I'm gonna show you that in just a second. And you can see that these conserved um, amino acids often correlate with the presence of, um, of predicted structure. So these sheets here. So um, this, this is an alanine scanning type approach that we took. And then what we did was transfect um, different constructs with these mutations, individual mutations to see if any of these affected outcome. And um, so these are some of our favorite mutants. So here what we're doing is transfecting the NTD into the nucleus. Here's the wild type again. You see these little round dots. And remember, we're gonna ignore the nucleal or staining. These are actually HeLa cells. So you can see the endogenous coilin is overlapping with the NTD that has gone and joined the coilin here in the HeLa cell. Okay, so here's the merge. So those are the nucleoli. All right, so here's one of our favorite mutants, R8A. It makes the new NTD completely incapable of assembling into a round dot. As you can see, it's like dusky, sort of distributed all over the place. Not only that, it takes apart the existing cohal bodies. So it's got a dominant negative effect, just like its friend D79A down here, which is also dispersed throughout the nucleus and it has taken apart the cohal bodies. So lots of nice examples of dominant negative mutations. So perhaps, as we believe, related to the fact that these NTD um, molecules can interact with each other, at least as dimers and potentially as um, some other form of multimers that's behind the assembly of the Cajal body. This is actually my favorite mutation, R36A, which rather unbelievably causes the NTD to now form filaments very similar to those cytoplasmic filaments that we showed. And these filaments form in the nucleus. Ha! Huh. So what I'm gonna suggest is that what's happened here is we have disrupted interactions between the coilin NTD and a ligand in the nucleus. And the reason we made filaments out in the cytoplasm is that that ligand is not present in, this, in the uh, cytoplasm. So in other words, the R36A mutation in the nucleus is very similar to putting this protein in the cytoplasm where the ligand does not exist. Not only that, but once again, it's a dominant negative mutation. Look at that. It has sucked up the endogenous coilin wild type molecules onto these oligomers or filaments in the nucleus. Again, suggesting that these molecules can associate with one another into higher order structures. So you can take these wild type dudes and bring them into these aberrant structures, no problem. Can yes. Ask myself a question? Yes, Antonio has a question. It, it seems like, especially in the mutation, the R36A, that there's a very clear, they are together, but there's a very clear distinction, like half of the fibril is from the coiling, the other one is from the other one. That's a great observation. So there's some kind of heterogeneity here in terms of like the, the yeah, exactly, the preponderance of the red versus the green. Um, so that's the HA tag versus the endogenous coilin. And exactly, we don't understand the structure of this thing yet. So I, I think you're right that this is, it's a patterning. It's, there's some kind of patterning going on and we don't understand this quite yet at the molecular level. We really need to do, um, you know, molecular structure on this. Okay, so obviously we can benefit from these mutations um, in doing structure. And I've got a new student in the lab who's hell bent on biophysics here, so. Um, advance the slide, you'll get a, night, a flavor for um, how we're viewing this. Okay, yeah, so here's a predicted structure. Um, and so remember I showed you those sheets um, and there was a coil. 
Um, so this is the kind of ubiquitin-like fold that was that's predicted, um, and it turns out these amino acids, interestingly enough, are on different faces for one of one another. So you can imagine all kinds of models for how coilin coilin interactions look versus coilin NOP140 uh, something else um, interactions. I already named it NOP140 exactly. So we um, this is the name of the molecule that we guessed it might be, and we have really good evidence um, that it is NOP140. So I'll, I'll take you through that. But look at um, the arrangement here. So these. Amino acids that we've implicated in coilin-coilin interactions based on these mutant phenotypes are on the one face, and amino acids that we've implicated in this filament or, or antagonizing the filament formation um, are on the other face. Okay, so why did I whip out um, the name NOP140? It's not a very attractive name even. I wish, I wish it had another name. Um, actually, the gene name is NOLC1, which will become more important in a minute. Um, the reason is that there's a very old paper that used a yeast two hybrid um, type of strategy to say that coilin interacted with NOP140. So it was on our candidate list. NOP140 is actually an abundant protein in nucleoli. There are some nuclear components that are present in cohal bodies. So we knew about this. And also just staring a NOP140 is just like amazing because it's 700 amino acids basically of intrinsically disordered region. The um, only structured region is this pathetically small LIS-H domain at the end terminus. So it's just like not very interesting there. And I'm gonna show you in a minute that it's capable of condensation, um, which is completely not surprising. Okay, so that's why we got interested in NOP140 and we predicted then that coilin will bind directly um, to NOP140. We could confirm that using a FRET assay. So on top here, this is an indirect FRET in cells that looks at coilin NOP140 on the one hand. So these are CFP, YFP pairs. And then um, we looked at coilin coilin FRET down below. And in the NOP140 FRET, you can see that this R36A Mutation completely abolishes the interaction between coilin and NOP140, which we, you know, putatively assigned um, to this interaction phase. And then coilin coilin fret is completely abolished when we mutate R8A over here on this other face. There are clearly more um, complicated things going on here because some of these mutations, um, you know, don't play out exactly as how we predicted it, but. Um, Still, the results are pretty consistent with these ideas that we have coiling coiling interactions on the one side and coiling NOP140 interactions on the other side. And then finally, we used, um, I'm going to talk about this later, but the CRY2 assay from Cliff Brangwin's lab, I'm imagining that this audience is pretty familiar um, with the CRY2 assay. So I kind of threw this in here just to show you the result. So first of all, on the right, um, this is the evidence that NOP140 can do biomolecular condensation as defined by the CRY2 assay of Cliff Brangwen again, where um, when you express this construct, we took the IDR of NOP140 and hooked it up to M cherry CRY2. You express it in uh, 3T3 cells, you see very uniform but high expression. And then when you turn the light on and dimerize the NOP140 construct, you see these um, very large dark uh, condensate type objects. And then of course, when you turn the light off, they disperse. And so that's kind of our definition of condensation um, in this context. Okay, so NOP140 sort of fits the bill. You could imagine NOP140 then being the kind of IDR providing condensation function for coilin in trans, because coilin is binding to this. Coilin itself, you could say, well, coilin has an IDR. Why does it need to go hang on to someone else? But when we take the coilin IDR and make a construct out of that, um, so basically what I'm showing you here, I just chose to show you the delta NTD construct. So that's the coilin IDR together with the C terminus. You can see this even expression again, very high level of expression, turn on the light and no condensates are forming. So we basically don't have any evidence that any portion of the coilin molecule has the ability to um, make condensates, at least not in this assay. Um, and so that's why we have proposed that coilin binds to um, NOP140 and does so in trans. And this is kind of our, our little model then that, uh, that posits that out in the cytoplasm, 
these amino acids that we've been able to study through these single amino acid mutations um, can mediate fibril formation. But in the nucleus, this is buffered by binding to NOP140, these little um, aqua structures here that either limit oligomerization by coilin or take long oligomer oligomers and maybe even wrap them up into a ball like a ball of yarn. Um, and we don't know um, which of those two um, hypotheses is correct currently. So, um, so I just told you what we know about Coilin's role in the assembly of the Cajal body. And now I'm about to launch into a discussion of our um, mass spectrometry uh, study where we go to de novo identify a Cajal body proteins. Um, and so I'm gonna be telling you about some new constituents. Does anybody have any questions about that um, assembly part that I talked about? I don't know if it's a question about the assembly part, but John Henninger has a question. Uh, yes, actually, it is, a, it is a question about the assembly part. Um, so as you're probably aware, um, Tony Hyman and Simon Alberti had this paper in 2018 about the phase separation of FUS in the nucleus versus the cytoplasm and how the total right. RNA levels actually regulate that. So it struck me that most of your mutations are in arginines. I'm just wondering if you think that RNA could be mediating this behavior. Um, exactly. So thank you for asking that question. We have, a, you know, you know, of course, so there are different kinds of RNA in the different compartments. I'm sure everyone knows this. So the SNRNAs, for example, are at high concentration in the nucleus, and they're essentially absent from the cytoplasm. Um, same with the SNOW RNAs. So these are the relevant RNAs for Cajal bodies. Um, and so, but at the same time, there could be a buffering effect of RNA in general. So I didn't mention that aspect because I just don't know what to say about it at this point. I have shown you that coilin binds to RNA due to this clip experiment, but we don't know what region in coilin binds to RNA. And that's part of the reason we picked these arginine molecules. Um, so there could be, um, officially speaking, there could be, for example, an RNA between the two NTDs that are binding to each other and that we're detecting by FRET. I mean, FRET is a very close interaction, so um, it's possible that there's an RNA involved, but we currently don't have any evidence for that. So what we're doing right now is we're trying to really rigorously define where the RNA binding domain on the coilin protein is. And I'm sorry that I can't tell you more uh, about that, but we do suspect that it's actually uh, further down towards the C terminus where there's an RG repeat. Um, and, and there's other indications that the SNRPs actually bind towards the C terminus. So basically our um, all the suggestions point to this more C-terminal region is binding the RNA, but we haven't rigorously shown that yet. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you about using coilin to identify the proteins in cow bodies. Yeah. We have a kitchen table talk question. Or another okay, question. another one. <laughs> awesome. So I have a question about the, the coilin fibrils. Do you envision any function for the fibrils? Well, we haven't seen fibrils. No one has seen any fibril, you know, aside from this unusual situation that the NTD is uh, expressed in the cytoplasm. In fact, when we express the full length protein or GFP tagged NTD in the cytoplasm, we don't get them. So I don't think that the fibril formation in the cytoplasm um, it shows that the NTD can do this, but it doesn't tell us, you know, when or if this is a physiological state. So we're, we're sort of seeing it as an indication that the NTD can, um, can do fibril formation, which we didn't know before. But um, we're not exactly sure if in the Cajal body, for example, if we, done, if we do cryo-ET, would we see wrapped up fibrils? There's actually, um, I didn't put a slide in my, uh, my thing. I could potentially maybe at the end go and get a picture if you'd like to see it. But old EM pictures of the Cajal body do, they, it used to be called the coiled body because it looks like an electron dense coiled up thing. You know, and so I, I'm very cautious uh, about saying that these are completely artifactual because it is possible that these, um, you know, that there are oligomers that are rolled up in the Cajal body, maybe um, 
kind of like a jelly roll with the NOP140 molecule, making it into a, a round thing, because it's clearly, you know, it's it's never been seen before in the nucleus as a as a fibril. Um, and then just a, a second question. Did you say that, can, do you ever see Cajal bodies in the cytoplasm? No. Never? No. Not even in pathological states? No, um, there is one pathological state related to the SMN protein um, that I'm going to talk about later. So this protein, when it's absent, causes spinal muscular atrophy, which is um, degenerative motor neuron disease of children that's fatal. And in patients with SMA, their Cajal bodies look abnormal, which makes sense. That SMN protein nucleates those gems that I showed you on the very first slide, and I'm going to be coming back to that um, later. So again, that's a case where even though SMN is, uh, has a cytoplasmic role in SNRP assembly, um, no, we, no, no, coilin's never in the cytoplasm I, that I know of. I mean, obviously. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So here's oh, so more questions. I, I have a follow-up to Tina's question, actually. So okay. in the instances where you get these cytoplasmic fibrils, it, and, and apologies if I missed this, if you make yep. point mutations that abrogate the ability to fibrilize, do you then, if, if, if those mutants are made in the context of the full-length protein, do they mess up nuclear function? In other words, is that... So, fibrillization activity reporting on some functional self-assembly that even in the sort of endogenous context is important? Um, well, kind of. So, okay. So we would have to say that if we look at these mutations, um, we would have to say that these, these amino acids are involved in forming fibrils because when we get rid of those amino acids, these arginines, we now have just diffuse protein, doesn't assemble into anything. And it also, which I think is very important, takes apart existing oligomers in, that were present, you know, the wild type coilin. okay? So I would think that this is the, these are the amino acids required for making fibrils. What the R36A is doing is allowing you to see those fibrils because it's inhibiting binding to NOP140. Do you see what I mean? I don't know exactly. I mean, I guess what you're asking for is the R36A mutation in the same NTD as we've made an R8A mutation. That's a cute idea. We haven't tried that. Well, yes, you're right. We should do that. We sh you're right. We should do that. Awesome. Come join my lab. <laughs> there's a, as you can imagine, there's a lot of these sort of permutations, not to mention, yeah. Okay, so let me tell you about this um, mass spec experiment. Um, so here's what we did. So I know I, you guys probably know Anne Gingras's experiments where she um, is using BioID to try to do comprehensive proteomics on different biomolecular condensates in cells. And um, so we took a different, a slightly different approach to her. So we're using Apex2, which um, is, enables us to do a one minute peroxide treatment in order to, um, with the biotin phenol, in order to biotinylate proteins that are in the neighborhood of Cajal bodies. So that's in contrast to this. So the, before we started planning this before Turbo Bio ID, but okay. So a lot of the proximity biotinylation experiments that have been published have been done with much longer incubations of the appropriate reagent. And we wanted to make sure that the incubation be really short because we know that coilin actually, you know, leaves the Cajal body with a, a time constant of something like a minute. So what we want is to have Cajal bodies sort of sitting there, add uh, biofin biotin phenol and peroxide for one minute and basically, you know, get a picture of what are the proteins that are near coilin in the call body. Um, and so what Diana I Arias Escaiola did was she made these beautiful cell lines where she titrated extremely carefully um, the coilin apex two expression so that it was not expressed throughout the nucleoplasm, which you will see often in some high throughput um, proximity biotinylation type experiments. 
Uh, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but if you see the whole nucleus is labeled, then you're um, not probably not only um, labeling the Cajal body. So these coilin apex two constructs are in Cajal bodies overlapping um, with coilin, and then they have SNRPs in them and an um, NOP140 in them, as you might expect. And when we do the biotinylation reaction, what you can see is um, the, the biotin is actually localized in the Cajal body. So this is what we wanted. Now we have controls, um, and our two controls are the delta NTD construct. So again, remember I showed you the CRY2 experiment. This is exactly the same result. If we cut the NTD off of coilin and have it connected to apex two, it's expressed all over the nucleus. And so is the biotin created there. And then the apex two NLS construct is simply, you know, sort of again, to go after any kind of um, background type of signal that you could imagine getting, right? It's very hard to make the right controls for these types of experiments, but we're doing our best. And I think these are two pretty good ways of um, looking at the data. So we collaborated with Falk Butter and Emily Nischwitz in, um, in Mainz, <laughs> old colleagues of Antonio, um, and also uh, old colleagues of ours. We've done numerous mass spec experiments with them. Um, Falk is just an, an amazing uh, scientist. He does mass spec, but he's also really great at the data analysis. So I feel very confident um, when we come up with uh, these volcano plots where um, you can see some old friends. So these are kind of known in orange. These no, co there's Coilin, there's TGS1, uh, always is the top hit in our hands. Um, that's a, an enzyme that puts the cap onto SNRNAs. And then um, here is NOLC1, that's NOP140. So that makes a lot of sense that NOP140 would be labeled uh, by Coilin, okay? So there are also these green dots, so many new uh, components um, we had 100 proteins enriched, and of these we would call 70 new components. And I'm not going to show you all their names and talk extensively about each of their roles, um, but what I would like to show you is a kind of summary table that puts them into categories based on kind of what they do. Um, so we have sort of DNA replication repair, cell cycle rep uh, progression, and transcription as major new hits. So if you compare that to what was known before and what's new, um, this is really upping the number of factors that are involved in transcription and DNA biology as compared to the other categories, for example, pre-mRNA splicing and three prime end cleavage. Um, many of these were already known. We're adding a few new components, but this was already you know, the most highly enriched um, uh, category that we had before. So, so what we've got here is a couple of new areas. Um, in particular, I think it's striking that now transcription is that much more elevated, that it's on a par with splicing factors. And this kind of goes back to our notion that the Cajal bodies are nucleated co-transcriptionally. Um, and so we need to dig into, um, you know, maybe some of those, tr the transcriptional relevance more in future. And the reason I've um, encircled these two categories um, in orange is these are uh, involved in our RNA processing, which we already expected because I told you that snow RNPs transit through Cajal bodies on the way to the nucleolus. I think I mentioned that briefly. So we kind of expected to see this, but what we really didn't want to see is ribosomal proteins, right? Because you, know, you tell yourself, oh, this is just some kind of background or something like that. But okay, we're being comprehensive, so we're going to keep them on the list. They, um, you know, passed all the tests of the, all the different controls and so on. So now what we did was we came to a functional test. So what we did was we did an siRNA screens um, in a high throughput format at the Yale Center for Molecular Discovery, and then we did a, um, a staining assay where we visualized nucleoli and Cajal bodies. And we just asked for things that would disrupt the number of Cajal bodies. Okay, so we've got all of the hits. We also have all the previously curated protein components of Cajal bodies that we could get out of the literature and so on. So um, this is kind of what we got. Um, um, we got uh, a number of, let me see, what should I point at? I'm going to just point at this histogram here. Um, 
what we got in terms which we expressed in this histogram as a normalized percent effect on the number of bodies which were automatically counted by the imaging software is we got 25 hits that decreased the number of cohal bodies okay fine you would think you knock down coilin you have less cohal bodies you knock down nop 140 you have less cohal bodies this is all true what was very striking is we got um, nine hits that increase the number of cohal bodies, which is really weird. Um, and so we decided to focus on, the, on these guys for the purpose of this study. Let's pursue who those are. And um, it turned out they were these uh, components of the large uh, subunit of the ribosome. So here you can see these intrinsically disordered proteins that actually fold when they lie down on the ribosomal RNA, um, like they're on a beach or something like that. They associate with the RNA, it's actually very beautiful. Mm -hmm. So here they are, they're kind of uh, clustered in a particular part of the large subunit. These are the two faces of the um, ribosome. And these are the dudes who um, cause there to be more um, Cajal bodies. So just in a group, these are all involved, either involved in large ribosome subunit assembly or in the large uh, subunit. And so, um, uh, what do I want to show you? So one of the ways that you could imagine getting this is if the cells become aneuploid. Um, we do know that cohal bodies um, increase when you increase the ploidy, and that, again, has to do with the chromosomal association that you would expect. And so one of the hits is anilin that actually blocks cell division and makes cells become aneuploid. You can see that um, in, in quantification of the DNA content, um, anilin knockdown is making cells aneuploid and it also makes the number of cohal bodies um, increase. But in contrast, testing all of these uh, large ribosomal subunit proteins like RPL14, which I'm showing here, does not change the ploidy of the cells. So it's not about ploidy. There's something that happens when you knock down these particular only large subunit ribosomal proteins um, that causes there to be about twice as many cohal bodies as there were before. So we decided to apply this um, chip experiment that I told you about where we can chip coil in onto particular genes. And I'm just showing you the histone gene cluster on chromosome six here. Here are all these little histone genes. And you can see that in the control situation, the control siRNA, we see um, accumulation of coil in um, over these histone loci. Um, and interestingly, in the um, RPL14 and RPL24 knockdown, these become less. So the, the concentration over these particular genes um, is disrupted and it's just a lot more like chatter. Um, a kind of zoom in um, to this, this particular gene uh, kind of underscores this, where you see a peak over here that, that um, resembles uh, Paul 2 for example. So this, this concentration of coilin that coincides with Paul 2 in the two knockdowns is destroyed. Um, and interestingly, the transcription of the histone gene is also, um, it's, it's suggested that the uh, transcription of this gene is disrupted. So um, this uh, result actually implies that the, the extra cohal bodies that we're seeing are extra chromosomal because they're less well associated with the chromosomal regions um, than they were before. Um, so I, I wanna give you just one more hint about potentially what these proteins could be doing. And that comes from um, this imaging experiment uh, that's shown here on the left where I'm showing you the coilin together with SMN staining. Um, and I mentioned this SMN protein before as marking the gems. And so what happens when you knock, um, so this is showing this sort of ball in socket arrangement or the, the baseball in the, in the glove where we see the gem associated with the cohal body in the confocal microscope. And then when we knock down this, our, this large ribosomal protein, what happens is the SMN merges with the coilin. So this is really a very distinct phenotype and we've seen it one time before and I'm about to tell you um, about that situation. Um, so first I wanna show you what this really looks like in the STED microscope because this is really a very um, dramatic phenotype 
Um, and that's why we believe that this is telling us something, even though we don't wholly understand it. So here, what you can see is, again, the coilin marked in pink and the SMN marked in blue. And what happens when you knock down these two different ribosomal proteins is now the SMN is mixing together with the coilin. So we're changing the substructure of the Cajal body. Um, the consequences of this for function, we're not sure about, but obviously we'd be interested in learning what that is. Um, we can show this with all sorts of quantification in terms of the offset and the um, intensity overlap. So we really um, believe in this phenotype as being uh, important. Part of the reason we're really uh, kind of gobsmacked to see this is that we had just seen this quite recently in a previous study. And that had to do with um, the study in which we described this um, arrangement. And so I want to now tell you a bit about um, SMN and um, uh, its role in the assembly of the Cajal body, which again you see here by Stead. And this is the sort of uh, image of the collective image of 20 different Cajal bodies uh, reconstructed in three dimensions. And you can see that it has this kind of open structure where it holds the Cajal body, uh, the gem, sorry, uh, in, in like in the baseball mitt. Okay, so um, what I want to tell you about is how uh, SMN actually has a function, which is to bind this um, modification on arginine. So this is uh, an arginine side chain that you're looking at here. And this can be modified by dimethylation. And the dimethylation can either be symmetrical as shown here. So in other words, each one of these terminal nitrogens gets a methyl group or it could be asymmetrical, in which case one of the nitrogens gets two methyl groups. So these are two post-translational modifications on arginine that have been studied in the context of stress granules. Some of you may be aware G3BP1 is modified by dimethyl arginine, and this is important for intramolecular interactions for G3BP1 in forming stress granules. What we found is that when we used ADMA inhibitors um, in our STED experiment, again, looking at SMN and coilin, just as I showed you before for the RPL, when you use ADA, ADMA inhibitors, so this is an inhibitor of the methyltransferase that makes this uh, post-translational modification, you have a mixing of the SMN, again, with the coilin. So this is, it looks identical to this RPL protein knockdown this is just astonishingly similar. The ribosomal proteins are not only intrinsically disordered, but they are very high, heavily you know, dimethylated. So we think that there's some kind of connection here, but we're not exactly sure what it means. Um, okay, so let, let, let me tell you more about what we think is going on um, with SMN. Okay, so this is actually what these, um, this arrangement, the ball and socket or the baseball mitt looks like in the standard confocal microscopy. I showed you another image that looks like this, so I think you're all used to it now. So here's your coilin and SMN. I showed you this exact same, this is the same images I showed you before. This is with the ADMA um, inhibitor. And then um, over here, we, you see what happens with the SDMA inhibitor. It's just something very specific going on with dimethylation. Because here what you see happens is the gem completely separates from Cajal bodies. Both objects are okay. They're just completely separated from one another. Have a look at this nucleus. There's a bunch of pink dots and a bunch of green dots and they're not talking to each other anymore. So weird. And now if we combine the two methyltransferase inhibitors, what you see is the gems are okay. If anything, they look a bit big. And the Cajal bodies get really little teeny tiny dots. You could also say they disassemble. They just turn into these little wimpy, wimpy tiny things. Okay, so dimethylation is really important for Cajal body integrity. And we know that SMN binds to dimethyl arginine. This is the molecular structure of SMN. It has a Tudor domain that binds dimethyl arginine. So what is going on here? We think that SMN in the gem must bind at the interface some molecules in the Cajal body part. And we know that it binds coilin. I'll show you that in a minute. 
but it binds coilin because we know the arginines in coilin are dimethylated. At least some of the arginines are dimethylated. Okay. How do we know that the Tudor domain um, is important for forming bodies or condensing at all? Well, we had this paper last year and I'm just, I don't know, maybe you read it. I'll just uh, remind you. So this is again, the CRY2 assay of Cliff, Cliff, Cliff Brangwen's lab. And we used as a test domain, the um, SMN Tudor domain. And what we found in this uh, study is that when you turn the lights on, now it forms condensates both in the nucleus and in the cytoplasm. The reason it's present in the cytoplasm is it does some of the surface cytoplasmic part of SNRP assembly out there in the cytoplasm, it's interacting with the SNRPs. Okay, so the question is, what is it doing in the nucleus? And mind you, nobody knows what the function of SMN in the nucleus is. Okay, so um, this is just a tiny bit that we took out, that I took out of the paper. This is showing the molecular structure of the Tudor domain. There's an aromatic cage, these green amino acids here that binds to the SDMA, which is fitting into this aromatic pocket. Here is one of the SM, SMA mutations from a patient. This, is, this uh, glutamate is hydrogen bonding to the back face of this aromatic cage. And when you mutate it to a lysine, it will, not it will destabilize the aromatic cage. So it binds less, it's been shown in this paper, it binds less well to dimethyl arginine and causes, you know, a fatal childhood disease. Okay, so it's important that SMN binds to dimethyl arginine, and we could show that in the absence of binding to dimethyl arginine, either by mutating any one of these amino acids in the aromatic cage, or by using the same drugs I showed you before, that we could block um, optodroplet formation um, as measured by a clustering metric that we came up with uh, alongside Jörg Beversdorf, our, our collaborator. I feel like I've just like said a whole lot of really long sentences. So I hope that th that was digestible to the audience. And maybe if you need any clarifying questions, um, you can go ahead and ask. Is, are there any questions before I start to tell you about more ligands for the SMN tutor domain? So our, just to review, We've shown the SMN tutor domain is important for biomolecular condensation. We know the SMN tutor domain binds dimethyl arginine modified proteins, but my argument is we don't actually know what all of the um, ligands are for the SMN tutor domain. And the reason is that I don't think we know what they all are is that coilins dimethyl arginine does not account for um, the creation of these opto droplets. Um, for example, we can knock down coilin and SMN will still make opto droplets. So that's um, part of our, our set of arguments. Does anybody have any questions? Not in chat. Are they, no, do you no. think they're comatose at this point? No, I think they're very excited. I think there's a number of questions coming up at the end, but we're just holding on. Okay. Well, okay, so this is kind of my, um, my summary slide. So um, just highlighting uh, the binding to um, transcription sites, the fact that it's in a complex with gems, but that unlike the previous uh, idea that, that the gem components were mixed with the Cajal body, we now realize that they're not mixed, that they're kind of docked onto one another, and that that's important uh, for, for generating the Cajal body structure. Um, that there are ligands um, for SMN that likely participate in generating Cajal bodies um, and that um, we're, we're trying to find those and other RNAs that um, assist in this process. Um, and I also told you about a sort of comprehensive um, discovery of these new proteins um, uh, by this proximity uh, method. I'm just gonna quickly um, thank my lab and then I'll come back to that summary slide. So this is Daniela who's doing the SMN uh, tutor experiment. This is Leo with the idea to digest um, the extract <laughs> with RNAs. This is Diana who did the apex uh, coilin experiment and this, the functional screen. And uh, unfortunately, Martin um, is, uh, no, oh, there's Sarah Gellis. Oh, so she's helping out with the NTD uh, project, doing amazing uh, work to try to uh, understand these amino acid mutations um, from a bit biophysical angle. Okay, so I'll just go back to this summary slide and uh, see if there are any questions. 
Right, so. Um, Great talk, thank you. Uh, what time is it? Is it midnight yet? It, it, we're, we're, we're over time, but it's okay. We're a little over, but we <laughs> definitely held you back a little. <laughs> so I I have a couple of questions, but I know that Bead, which is there, also has a few questions. And Trudy um, has one too. Do you, want, turns. do you want to start? Should I stop sharing? Do you do we want to talk or do, does anybody want to go back to slides to see something that they Maybe check with Trudy first? Sure. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Um, I think it's better to keep the slides for now okay. in case there's a question. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Shruti, do you want to go ahead and ask a question? Yeah, um, amazing talk. Like probably one of the best that I've heard in a while. Thank you. Oh my God. <laughs> You're That's so funny. funny. <laughs> oh, I can't hear you now. What happened? We're, what? we're, we're we oh don't my. hear you. Oh, there you go. Oh, great. You had so many unsettling data, like a lot. Oh, and one of the most was, uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> most unsettling was how you knock down the ribosomal protein and then you see the merge of Kohal and Jam. Right. Um, what do you think is happening? Is it just like uh, methylation associated and how they are linked? Do you have any idea? Um, so one of the kind of woo-woo ideas that we suggested in the manuscript is that, you know, that, that, um, that sometimes, you know, these RPLs, they, we think about them as being on the ribosome. We've seen them in the molecular structure of the ribosome, but that they're not always on the ribosome, right? So in the nucleus, you have the nucleolus where the preribosomal subunits are formed. So it, and we do know that there's a lot of exchange between the nucleolus and the nucleoplasm and the call body. So what we are wondering is whether there's a lot of possibilities, but it could be, um, you know, there could be an, um, a condens condensate maybe made out of these intrinsically disordered proteins from the ribosome. I don't know if I want to call it a condensate, but, a, or a complex that um, might be present in the nucleoplasm and interact with, um, let's say, SMN um, in the, either the formation of the gem or the Cajal body and that, um, or buffer those interactions. And then if it's not there, then you have, you know, forced SMN to start binding other ligands that might be present in the Cajal body. Like why do these, molecular entities invade each other now you know that's that's the question so 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 in other words you know because each one depleted alone does it so that's why I invoked a complex because otherwise how could it be that um they individually buffer something with their dimethyl arginines do you see what i'm saying if, if that were the case wouldn't we need to knock down all of them in order to see such a dramatic effect yeah, so that's why um, I invoked a complex, but uh, and I'm talking to ribosome assembly type people to ask them if they know about this. But you know, I talked to Ulrika Kutai, who's like you know big expert in this, and yeah, she's, she's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So she's she thinks it's an exciting idea, but she doesn't know. So, so uh, you think there's a differential ligand in uh, gem or in uh, or in kahal that's causing that separation, but when you knock down uh, like RPL or do some mutation, this difference does not exist and they exactly. sort of merge. Cool. Right. I mean, the other thing to notice though is, so I argued that they're off the chromatin now. You could argue the reason they're off the chromatin, so it's a cause or, a cause or effect thing. It could be off the chromatin because the, for whatever reason, the depletion of these proteins is shutting down transcription um, but yet now you, you still have the call body formed. It's just floating around. But my point is there's, that's something that's also different. So if you look at my little model slide here, for example, I've got the coilin containing part on the nascent transcripts. But what I'm saying is now when we knock down RPL, maybe this is severed and maybe that um, maybe it's the RNA that's buffering, you know, that interaction between the gem and the, and the coilin in the absence of transcription now we can fuse the, the two bodies together so 
there's a lot of different ways that you can turn around the evidence that we have. You know, we have a lot of different kind of symptoms of what's going on, but we don't really know um, the cause, <laughs> which is really frustrating, actually. <sighs> So I'll, I'll, we're way over time, so I'll allow. Are we? I have more, no idea what time. One more question, quick question, if anyone has one. Mm -hmm. um, if, if okay, there's I know one. Trimming. There's the apex. We actually have yes. one from the audience. There's one in chat. Let's let's. Leonard, yes, I see that exactly. That's what we want to do now is the SMN um, apex two because thank you for bringing that up. We this is how distinct these bodies are normally. We did the Coilin Apex 2. We got a lot of expected uh, components, but I'm going to tell you, we didn't get SMN. We didn't get anything in the gem, which is the gemins. We so these things are are distinct. We did the um, SMN does not ship to the loci. Okay, so even though these things are intimately associated, they act like different objects. Isn't that amazing? We did not get SMN by Apex Coilin. But what I was wondering, labeling. I think that's Leonard's, Leonard's yeah. direction is like, when you get those fused, does that change? Do you start getting gemins and you start getting- Oh, is that, a, I can see the whole question. Actually. So the question is, <laughs> have you thought about apex proximity labeling with SM1 or SM1 to their domain fusions? In yes. To the yes. Okay. Yes. 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 So first of all, we haven't done SMN apex 2 at all. And, and by the way, we did everything in the nucleus. So we've got all the conditions worked out so that we won't get the cytoplasmic partners. We'll just get the nuclear part partners, which is what we want. And then clearly we could also, um, exactly, we could test the effect of depletion of uh, any of those RPLs on the, we, so it's actually a big experiment. We'll need to create Degron strains, great Degron lines for the RPLs, because these cells will not live very long um, with the knockdowns. So we're already kind of uncomfortable about these knockdowns um, that we conducted in the screen. So we are gonna wanna make um, ox and degron strains and deplete for the shortest amount of time possible. But then we wanna do that exact experiment that you suggested. That's a great experiment, yeah. Okay, I think that's the last, last one and then we're done. Oh. <laughs> I could stay forever, we can stay. <laughs> okay. Diego, may I please, Antonio, rather, yes, may I please ask one more? <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm super interested in the sort of, I guess, partial missability of the Cajal body and the gem. Like there's yeah. this invagination, but there's not like a mixing, right? Uh, so <clears throat> have, is that a fundamentally different material properties or surface tensions, or there's some sort of biophysical underpinning this? And, and, and like also have, in your CRY2 experiments, have you ever taken the gem protein and the Cajal body protein in the same cell line, both with CRY2 and tried to nucleate a mixed, um, like a fully, a fully mixed um, Cajal body gem? Um, okay, I, I do have some slides that I thought people might wanna see. Okay, so here's what we did. We didn't do what you just suggested. Um, what we did was we took, so these are the condensates formed by SMN, Tudor, in red, okay? So they're out in the cytoplasm, they're the red. And in the nucleus, this is a mouse nucleus, that's why you see the blue blobs, right? Centroid bodies, okay. And then in the nucleus, they're yellow because they're co-stained with coilin. So the condensates in the nucleus do recruit coilin but as I mentioned, you can knock down coilin and you still get condensates. So that's partly why we believe there are other ligands. So that's kind of as close as we got to the experiment that you just suggested. So we know they're in there, but they don't depend on coilin. We also did a lot of staining for other things, including bizarrely HNRMPU, but we didn't see staining. I mean, you know what antibody staining is like, like, you know, it's a whatever. It's <laughs> <laughs> but HNRPU was that guy that I was very excited about that really increased its binding um, when we degraded RNA. So, so this is just sort of, you know, a stab at trying to find out who could be in there. And um, so we did see SCMA, we did see some coilin, and we did see some uh, staining with this Y12 antibody. Um, uh, but there are a lot of dimethyl, you know, it also suggests that it's very specific. Like there are a lot of dimethyl arginine containing proteins that we already know about that are not in there. So that can't account for condensate formation. So. 
there's a lot we don't know. It's one of those results that uh, like raises way more questions than you had before. So, <laughs> which is a nice segue. It's yeah to stopping. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This, this is a, because Antonio it, has plans for this evening. I yes. <laughs> Because it's it's just wonderful talk. Thanks a lot, Thank and it you. generates a lot more questions. It answered yeah. quite a few. And uh, please, Jill. Yeah, this has been a fantastic discussion. We just thank you so much for sharing all your work. And I think we're going to need to ask you if we can email you with more questions. Would you be okay if we send or post your email with your video? Because it seems like there are a hundred more questions coming. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I don't know, 100. But sure. uh, the point is, is I think we're fully stimulated with or without okay. coffee today, thanks to your wonderful talk today. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Sounds good. So thank you so much, Carla. Um, and we will have more talks in the future. We have another one coming up in June. So if anybody wants to join that one, come back. Um, thanks again, everyone, for joining today. And you all have a great day. Okay, bye. Thanks for everyone's questions. That was great. Thanks again, Carla.